morning and thanks for tuning in again this Sunday. We are so excited to worship with you today for Palm Sunday. Listen, we know what's coming at the end of this week. We know Easter is there, but let's just spend this morning praising our God with joy, with adoration, shouting Hosanna, singing Hosanna, and fixing our eyes on our Savior. majestic God who absolutely loves and adores us, who sings a song of hope and life over us, and we as the redeemed who know what it means to live in the eternal love of Jesus, our response is to just praise Him and to know that He saved us from the hands of enemies, to say thank you Lord for reaching us, to sing with us the greatness of your love is pouring over us, and we now sing the song of the redeemed. The greatness of your love
Thank you, Caitlin. Don't you just love the idea of God singing over us, especially at a time like this, to just know that we are not forgotten. Hallelujah, praise God. Well, today is Palm Sunday, and I want to talk to you about parades. Well, who doesn't love a parade? Whether it's a March for Jesus, a Martin Luther King Jr. Day parade, or even Macy's New Year's Day parade, People flock to them to watch them or to be a part of them. And being in a parade is certainly a lot of fun. Okay, maybe not so much fun if you're the only one. Now, in the Gospel of Mark, we read about a parade that is being led by Jesus. Uh, this is his entry into Jerusalem at the beginning of the last week of his life before the crucifixion in Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. Please read with me. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you are doing this, say, the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. What we see in Mark 11 is a parade as Jesus enters into Jerusalem. It's an exciting moment for the crowd. For their cries, we can clearly see that their expectations were deliverance is at hand. But we need to keep in mind, though, that this entrance by Jesus is not some haphazard event, but a well thought out and orchestrated piece of prophetic theatre. This was a setup. Jesus had sent two of his disciples to go and collect the colt that had already been set aside for the purpose for him to ride in on it. And it's interesting to note that in this event there is a contrast between what Jesus is declaring and what the people are expecting. Jesus is fulfilling the prophecy in Zechariah. Matthew records it in his gospel in chapter 21 verse 5. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now this is found in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. But if we were to read a little further on in that prophecy, we will find that Zechariah continues this way. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. The rest of this prophecy tells us that this king would banish war from the land. No more chariots, 
war horses or bows. Commanding peace to the nations, he will be the king of peace. The people in the crowd seem to have other ideas about what is happening. As they cry Hosanna, they throw their cloaks down in front of him, evoking the actions of a crowd before a previous king. King Jehu, who was proclaimed king under the guidance of the prophet Elijah. In 2 Kings 9.13, we read this. They quickly took their cloaks and spread them under him on the bare steps. Then they blew the trumpet and shouted, Jehu is king! Jehu was a king who delivered Israel, but he did it through violent and bloody means. He was treacherous, shot his enemy in the back, massacred a family and slaughtered prisoners. It appears that the people may well have been expecting this kind of king to deliver them from the hands of their oppressors. And who were these oppressors? Well, they were one and they were two. You see, it was the Romans and then under them, the elite of Jerusalem. Now, the Romans had a different kind of procession that the people would have been familiar with. You see, the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, did not live in Jerusalem. In fact, he lived in Caesarea Maritima, a port city that had been built by King Herod the Great to honor Caesar Augustus. And during times of festivals, Pilate would travel into Jerusalem with his troops to reinforce the Roman garrison that was permanently stationed in the fortress overlooking the temple and its courts. Now, Passover is a festival that celebrates the liberation of the Jewish people from an earlier empire. And so you can understand that this empire, the Roman Empire, would be cautious to make sure the Israelites, the Jewish people, knew who was still in charge to make sure they could quell any thoughts of insurrection. We have two processions that we would know from this time. Jesus's proclaiming the kingdom of God and Pilate's, which would proclaim the might of empire. Now, the Roman procession would have been all about Roman strength and Roman religion, the two of which were inseparable. And as we're looking at the account of Jesus, it's not surprising to think that these kinds of words would be ringing in the air. Divine, Son of God, God from God, Redeemer, Liberator, Lord, Saviour of the world, God incarnate. But these were not being said about Jesus. These were titles that were ascribed to Caesar the Augustus. And in case you thought Augustus was his name, it was actually his title. And it meant the one to be worshipped. The theology of Rome was that Augustus was the son of the god Apollo. And that he was sent to bring peace on earth. After his death, he ascended into the heavens to take his seat amongst the gods. Now, Octavian Augustus was the first, and he was Caesar when Jesus was born. And after his death, his successors continued to bear these divine titles. Now, Tiberius was the Caesar at the time of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem here. Two processions, two sons of God, two saviors of the world, and two very different theologies. A third element in this event is the role of the temple in Jerusalem. Now, when Jesus was born, Herod the Great was a king over Jerusalem under the authority of Rome. When he died, his kingdom was passed between his three sons. Now, Archelaus was the son that found himself over Jerusalem, but he was removed from power in 6 AD by the Roman authorities who gave the governance of the city over to the temple. The temple was now in full collaboration with Rome. At the top of this new governing force was the high priest, the chief priest, the elders, and the scribes. Now, the high priest was appointed by Rome, and even though the Hebrew scriptures dictated that the position should last, uh, last a lifetime, there had actually been 18 different high priests, as different ones had been removed by the Roman authorities. The present high priest was Caiaphas, and he was clearly doing something right, because he'd been in that position for 18 years. But what we see is that the temple was not being run according to the scriptures, but according to the dictates of the state, the Roman Empire. Now, the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes, they all came from those high-ranking priestly families, the wealthy lay families, and the literate class. They were basically the fancy folk of Jerusalem, that elite group. Now, the role of the high priest and the temple authority in these days was kind of work as that in-between, the, the local system of domination and the imperial system of domination. But the temple had been given a specific role by God. We read this in scripture. 
These I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Sadly, the temple was not inviting to all. There were within its walls degrees of acceptance. Gentiles could only enter the outer courts. Women could only go in as far as the court of women. Men could enter further into the court of Israel. Priests could go further into the court of priests and only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies. In fact, there was an inscription for the Gentiles that read this. No foreigner is to go beyond the balustrade and the plaza of the temple zone. Whoever is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his death which will follow. Imagine that plastered on the outside of churches today. But we see Jesus allowing all to have access to him. All kinds of people, men, women, lepers, children, foreigners, prostitutes, tax collectors, etc., etc. The message of Jesus was critical of the temple and the role it played in this domination system. And you can imagine the tense feeling amongst the temple authorities as this man came in amongst them, causing all kinds of trouble while they're under the scrutiny of the Romans. Now, an important feature of the temple was that this was the only place where you could receive God's forgiveness. You know, when you can control people's access to God, it is so much easier to control the people. But John the baptizer had already started to undermine the role of the temple by offering forgiveness through his baptism outside of the temple. Then Jesus came along and did the same, but but with signs and wonders to back up his authority. And both Jesus and John offered forgiveness. And Jesus even sent out the disciples with the authority to forgive sins. This was undermining to the temple authorities. See, the temple and the city of Jerusalem were supposed to be places of peace, bringing peace to the world. But instead, they were in league with the domination system of imperial Rome that brought a false sense of peace through the tyranny of war. In Luke, we find this prophecy of Jesus leveled against Jerusalem because of the failure it has in bringing peace to everyone. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. What we have is a choice, as always, between violence and peace. The empire, the world, will always offer a way of violence. We are, by nature, a violent people who seem to resort to violence whenever the opportunity or whim strikes us. Not only do we act out in violence, but we respond to violence with more violence, whether it be through war or words written or spoken. The people shouting Hosanna were expecting a violent overthrow of the Romans. And too often we think that God is going to gain victory through the worldly acts of violence. But when we look to Christ on the cross, we have to come face to face with our own violence. In the city of God, we crucified the Son of God. In the city of peace, we brutalized and murdered the Prince of Peace. And the religious rulers looked on with approval. The temple authorities had thrown themselves in with the worldly system. Instead of standing against the tyranny of Rome, they supported and even took advantage of it to get what they wanted, and all in the name of God. And even today, we see people doing the same. It's easy for us to claim that we are following God when in fact all we're doing is following the powerful systems of the world. The violence, the unkindness, the greed, the fear-mongering. People who use the name of Jesus to divide rather than unite. Who try to restrict rather than include. But Jesus teaches us another way. And we have to decide which procession it is we want to join. Now, the truth is that Jesus' procession, it ends at the cross. It is costly. But even then, we see the riches of heaven poured out. Imagine if Jesus had acted out of worldly power with violence and domination. There would have been no resurrection, no eternal life. 
Jesus shows us the way of peace that trusts totally in the Father. He let human beings execute him. He didn't run away. He didn't call down a myriad of angels to smite the Romans and Jewish leaders. He didn't fight back with a sword. He fought back with peaceful protest, never compromising himself or his mission in any way. And throughout his ministry, he demonstrated his commitment to peace and to nonviolence. At one time, two of his disciples, James and John, wanted to call down fire on a Samaritan village that did not receive them. Jesus said no, and he rebuked them for it. When he sent out his disciples to share the good news, he told them to simply leave the places that did not receive them. No curses, no judgment. He escaped mods without using any kind of physical violence himself. And even at his arrest, he would not allow Peter to raise a sword in his defense. Jesus brings peace. He proclaimed peace to those of us who are far from God and those who are nearer to God. He brings peace, love, and restoration, not only between us and God, but to those who are in conflict with each other, the Jews and the Gentiles, the male and the female, the slave and the free. And peace with God gives us the peace of God that surpasses all comprehension. The procession of Jesus is the way of peace. It is the way of trusting in the Father even unto death, but then unto resurrection and eternity. The procession of Rome is the way of violence. It trusts in itself and has no hope beyond its own end. One procession lasts forever, but is costly to join. The other is easy to jump into, but only has short-term gains that in the end produce more pain than they can ever solve. Jesus is calling you to follow him. But so is the world. And which parade will you choose to follow? Will you follow the Prince of Peace or the power of empire? Now, the purpose of a parade is not the destination, but the parade itself. Choosing Christ is not about going to heaven, but about how we choose to live daily. We cannot walk in the violent, unkind, greedy and selfish parade of the world and expect to end up in the kingdom of God. When people see us walking in that parade, then how can we convince them that we are following Jesus? We have to choose daily to reject that call and follow the call of Jesus, who is calling us to follow him, to walk the path of peace, to embrace reconciliation, to practice forgiveness, and to live in love. We have been given before us the choice of life or death. And in these trying times, the world needs to see us walking in the parade that Jesus leads so that we can shine a light on the path to life. Friends, will you choose to follow him? Will you choose to leave the parade of the empire and join the parade of peace, the parade that leads to life? Thank you. That was a great message this morning. Listen, guys, I hope that you are feeling safe and healthy at home. Uh, please know that we are praying for you. If you have any prayer requests, you can leave them in the comments below. But we love you guys. We're looking forward to joining with you again at some point in the near future. But know that right now, as we are practicing social distancing, that God is still with you. He's still right there beside you, walking with you in this life and wanting to give you hope and peace uh, and, and just overflowing you with love. So thanks for tuning in. We'll see you again next week. Thank you.